You have to come until 2 o'clock. Do you want to stop with time for questions or do you want to go uh, to the end of the time? Uh, I'd like time for questions. So oh, great. is that for <laughs> 2? Should I speak until 2 and then there will be time uh, after? Let's go until 1.55. Okay. And I'll just be keeping time. So great. we'll have the 10, 5, and 1. Uh, and and at that point, Will the stop and start questions. So will the 10 be like 10 minutes before uh, the 55? Uh, yes. So okay. 10 minutes before you can stop talking and take questions. Great. So the time, basically the timer for until questions start. Great. Thank you. Oh, so within within here. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and I'll be speaking about uh, our work on adaptivity and trying to uh, speak about the modular architecture that we've tried to uh, design and how that architecture has allowed us to uh, both enable implementation of adaptive learning in edX and open edX, but also help lower the barriers and enable research and experimentation on the science of adaptive learning. Uh, great. So uh, I'd like to start off by, uh, I hope this is large enough for you guys to see, but uh, uh, this past year, Harvard and MIT uh, collaborated on a research report, uh, the year for uh, research report about analyzing the data about who are who are the learners who take uh, courses in edX and specifically the courses offered by Harvard X and MIT and they had a very nice uh, figure where they they visualized you know if a MOOC classroom had a hundred students who would they be and you had this really you know, diverse breakdown of male, female, age, location, uh, background, teacher, non-teacher, and also, you know, what do they intend to do in the course? And it was a variety of intents to either browse or intends to certify and the whole spectrum in between, and also educational background, of course. And with this whole diverse population of learners that a single course is trying to serve, uh, you know, you have the question, how do you possibly design a single course where, you know, you're serving the needs of all of these different learners from different backgrounds and have, having different, you know, not just backgrounds, but intentions for taking this course. And so, you know, one, one approach would be, let's try and uh, integrate adaptive learning and use adaptive learning as a strategy to better serve those learners. And you know, the basic idea is you know, trying to serve the right activity at the right time, um, trying to deliver resources and learning activities to, uh, you, know, you have to both monitor the learners to see what do you think is the best, uh, what do they need the most, but also having a knowledge of what are the possible activities that you can serve tagging and trying to do that matching, uh, designing an algorithm 
to figure out what's the best learner, or sorry, what's the best activity to serve to this learner at what time. And there's you know three kind of aspects that I'm not saying that uh, you know it's proven or you know it's working for every single adaptive algorithm strategy. But the idea is maybe these adaptive uh, approaches uh, they can be more efficient, as in uh, they save learners time. They learn the same material but in less time. Uh, and the idea behind that is. You know, you're not wasting time on things that you uh, already know or would be too easy or way too hard for you to be, uh, for that to be a useful activity. Uh, learners may be better engaged uh, because they're receiving activities that are more relevant uh, to their current skill level or interests or current knowledge levels and more effective, uh, you know, basically at the end of the course, do they have, have they learned the material more effectively? Have they learned more or less? So uh, a bit about, um, in my opinion, uh, what the state of adaptivity in learning systems looks like right now. Uh, there, are, there are systems where, you know, I describe them as bundled systems, where you have the learning platform, the content, and the adaptive engine and all the associated functionality all in one platform. Um, you know, the big, uh, big publisher have all of their own uh, platforms kind of like this. Um, and they tend to be pretty expensive. Uh, if you're already using an existing learning management system, uh, you, know, you have to make the choice, do I use this if I want to incorporate adaptivity into my instruction? Or do I stick with the system that, you know, maybe if you're in an institution or university that the rest of my school uses? Um, and then there are also uh, currently standalone engines, uh, I guess products that are just focused on the uh, adaptive engine side of it, where they basically offer a service that is, you know, just once you populate activities once you have populate the right metadata uh, and maybe this might be different for each product uh, then they'll start serving you recommendations maybe in the in the form of uh, an API communication interface uh, and then there you then have to think about you know now you can you you can bring your own LMS but you have to think about the integration and perhaps if you integrate with one adaptive engine, uh, it may not be necessarily interoperable. Um, that same integration may not work with, say, another adaptive engine. The interfaces are not, there's no real standard for that kind of interface. Uh, some other you know, criticisms or just you know, things that you kind of hear from instructors who are interested in adaptive learning and adaptive learning systems and integrating that into their courses. Uh, but this uh, aspect of you know, these systems are often, if they're commercial, uh, often they're not open source. Uh, they're kind of a black box. You don't really know what's happening under the hood. Uh, and you know, these are real uh, and also uh, configurability and tunability by instructors. And these are actual quotes uh, that we've heard from talking to real instructors and uh, providers that you know, we're really thinking about trying to ad incorporate adaptive learning. And these were some of the barriers that they had. You know, it wasn't really clear why a particular recommendation was being made when they were testing the system out. Uh, they want to be able to control the grading policy because grading policy has a huge effect on uh, how students are incentivized to operate, to, uh, to interact with the system. And uh, there is one instance where uh, a team was uh, trying out a commercial adaptive engine, but the adaptive engine wouldn't, it would just keep recommending problems uh, that, it would just take an hour to, or multiple hours in order to finish the sequence. And so that just wasn't really a great experience for learners. And, and not all adaptive learning is the same. There's so many different possible 
approaches and strategies for adaptive learning. So you can't just be like, oh, looks like my slides are not showing up. Here we go. So, yeah, so many different possible approaches and strategies. And maybe, you know, one strategy may not be as effective as another, but you kind of see oftentimes that there will be studies that are just like, you know, we used adaptive learning in our course and it was great and it helped learner outcomes, but you don't really get a sense of why why did it help learner outcomes or why did learner's behavior change the way that it did? And so, you know, we really need to move towards not just being like adaptive learning is great or studying adaptive learning versus non-adaptive uh, approaches, but more uh, trying to study, you know, this approach rather, this approach compared to that approach. Uh, they still might be adaptive, but uh, they're targeting different, uh, say, they have different strategies, different ways of going about trying to personalize material. And so uh, our research group, along with a lot of other both academic and industry partners, uh, we you know, came together and we started a initiative called, we call it Adaptive Learning Open Source Initiative. And our goal is to enable uh, and really lower the barriers for doing adaptive research, or sorry, adaptive learning research, adaptive learning implementation in courses. And so I'll try to describe, so there's all sorts of adaptivity experience that you could offer in a course. And here's the specific, uh, I guess, problem setting that we are in. Uh, so imagine you have a, mm, imagine you have a problem bank of, uh, of activities. Uh, and by activity, I mean, uh, it could be, in this case, let's say it's a multiple choice problem. And, you have multiple learners in the course, and uh, let's see if it comes up again. Uh, yep, that might be. Let's try. Okay, that's not going to work for you. Do you have like a H so HTML? That's, that's the and wrong one. Oh, yeah. That's the newer one. Sorry. Let's see. Uh, with a I guess like. Yeah. Well, it seems to be working now. So <laughs> let's see. <laughs> so. So yeah, imagine you have a problem bank full of activities, and uh, you've tagged each of these activities with, say, metadata like tagging topics, uh, maybe difficulty levels, that kind of thing. And you have learners in your course, and they, uh, they each are, they're going through a series of sequences, but uh, the one that you get next is not predetermined, rather it's, it's, uh, it's dynamic. So say you're on the first one, you wouldn't know which one you are going to get until you answer that, and our system uh, knows how you answered it. And then at that moment where you select the next activity, oh, so here's the interface. At the moment where you select the next activity, then that's where we compute uh, this is the right activity for you. And then you'll keep going until, say, we determine you know, you've reached some criteria where we think you should stop seeing problems. Maybe that's if you've reached a certain mastery level or Maybe we've just run out of problems in our problem bank or some other kind of fact criteria like that. And so you can see the, if, you know, probably most of you are familiar with, uh, you know, uh, resources on open edX. Like this is, it looks exactly like a normal multiple choice problem, right? And then 
uh, what you have in addition to that is just a little toolbar around it where after you submit it, you can select a next activity. And also, once you get activities, uh, the, you have uh, like a navigation bar populated. And it kind of dynamically grows as you progress through your dynamic sequence. And so I'll start getting into, uh, I guess, our architecture and how we are uh, utilizing OpenEdX in our architecture. And so maybe the first way to get at this is, seems a little bit of a complicated diagram is to see uh, you know, where are the places that we're using OpenEdX and features of OpenEdX in our architecture? And so uh, imagine, you know, uh, you have, I'll start off here with the LMS. Uh, the LMS, in our case, uh, might be edX. And we have all this other stuff here. What happens is inter the learner interacts with the system through LTI. And we have a bridge component here. And then it launches into the content source. Uh, the content source is where all the activities are stored. And the content source, in our case, is actually another instance of OpenEdX. It's not the same instance, but rather uh, like a separate instance that we just run ourselves. And that's where our content is host hosted. And so uh, there's a couple features that we're using just in that kind of uh, launch mechanism. One is, of course, we're using edX as, you know, as the LMS, as its main kind of functionality, uh, core functionality. We're also using edX as an LTI consumer. Probably a lot of you are familiar with, uh, you know, there are so many LTI tools out there. Uh, I guess you'd call them LTI providers. And what you can do is, you know, once you set up uh, like a set of uh, authentication credentials, uh, you can kind of install these uh, one of many possible, I guess, apps or tools into your course that learners can go launch into. And what that launch does is it provides some kind of user identity uh, to that other tool provider so that they can provide some kind of uh, customized experience for that learner or know who that learner is. Uh, and so that, that's what we're using on the LMS side. Uh, and then on the content source side, I think this is where things are a little bit more creative. Uh, so maybe not as many of you may know that uh, OpenEdX has, can act not just as an LTI consumer, but also as an LTI provider. And so what that means is that instead of you coming to, say, edX and launching into another tool, what happens is that uh, some other tool or LMS is launching into OpenEdX and seeing the content that's hosted on OpenEdX uh, in that other platform. And so that's the LTI provider mechanism. Uh, and we're also um, something that really drove our decision to use OpenEdX in this way was uh, because of all the content authoring functionality that's built into OpenEdX, we didn't really want to create our own content authoring system. And so this was a really nice way to just take advantage of that whole authoring system, but also all the really advanced problem types that uh, are possible uh, because of all the different types of Xbox uh, on, on the OpenEdX platform. And so that's how we're using open edX in this architecture. Uh, I'll also point out uh, the other two components in this architecture. Uh, the bridge, which is in the middle, uh, which kind of uh, coordinates uh, data and what, whatever needs to be coordinated between these three systems, the LMS, the content source, and the engine. And then finally, uh, the last component uh, on the bottom outlined in red is uh, the adaptive engine. And basically, it is kind of acting like what I described as a standalone engine previously. Um, basically, it's just its own web application that purely handles the uh, logic of uh, getting data, computing what it needs to compute, and then spitting out a recommendation through, say, an API interface uh, to, 
to an external system. And we can take a closer look in, inside that box uh, because it's not just a black box, it's an open source application or open source project. And uh, there are a couple aspects here at play. Uh, if you think about what you need to do in an adaptive engine, you can think of it as, one, I need to have some kind of model or, uh, I don't know, some, some kind of, uh, say, mastery level or uh, model of the learner where you kind of know at what time, you know, in some state of time, you know, how is the learner progressing in some kind of dimension. And so that's what we call knowledge tracing, and we use Bayesian knowledge tracing, a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty popular algorithm in the adaptive learning literature. And we use that for modeling the probabilities that uh, learners have mastered uh, one or many concepts. And then on the other side of this, uh, there's the recommendation logic. And so what we do there is uh, we actually have a couple of uh, you call them, uh, you can call them sub-strategies, where uh, we compute some kind of, say if you have a problem bank, uh, maybe with 10 activities, what we're doing is computing a score for each of those activities uh, that kind of uh, demonstrates its relevance to the learner at some certain time. And we have four ways of doing this, and so what we do is we have uh, four weights that we predefine and we just do a weighted average, and then the activity that has the highest score in the end, of, uh, after that weighted sum, uh, will be the one that we serve to the learner. And so uh, we've deployed uh, iterations of this system in two courses so far. Uh, the first one, which Anand uh, mentioned in his keynote, was Super, Super Earths in Life. Uh, that launched, I'm not sure, maybe one, two, a little bit more than a year ago, maybe two years ago. Uh, and then the more recent one, which launched uh, end of October of last year, was uh, we worked with Microsoft. Uh, they were hosting this course on edX uh, on data analysis using Excel. And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the course setup and results that we got from that, uh, from that experiment. And so this, you know, we did run a experiment here where uh, we had three conditions. One was uh, let's give the learner a non-adaptive experience. Uh, the one in the middle was uh, let's give them a adaptive experience, but let's, uh, I talked about those weights on those different sub-strategies before, and let's weight the uh, sub-strategy where uh, where we give a higher score to activities that are more similar to the ones that uh, they have just seen. Uh, so in practice, what that is is, you know, learners would be more likely to see problems that are related to the last problem that they saw. Uh, and then the last one, algorithm one, was uh, we call it remediation. Uh, this is uh, a strategy that emphasizes uh, scoring activities based on uh, what, if they're tagged with topics that the learner, that we think the learner doesn't really know as well yet. And so a little bit less of, say, what they've seen before, but rather uh, it's a little bit more, I guess you'd call it adaptive. Uh, they're trying, uh, they, they should see things that we think they need practice on. And here's another uh, feature of Open edX that we used in order to implement this uh, experiment in practice. Uh, in order to have uh, different uh, experiences in the course, uh, there's a feature called content experiments where for uh, certain blocks, you can say, you know, uh, divide the population of learner into, say, in this case, three groups. and um, they get randomly assigned into one of these three groups. And the first group, uh, or actually, yeah, they got, dis they, they got divided into three groups, and two of those groups had the adaptive experience, and then uh, the last group got a non-adaptive experience. And then 
uh, for those two groups that did get the adaptive experiments, then we divided them into half. Uh, one had algorithm one and one had al algorithm two, which were the different adaptive strategies. And so uh, some, I'll highlight some, uh, two of the results that we, that we saw. Uh, one was about uh, drop-off. And so you can see in uh, each, each of these uh, are weak, each of these are different modules or get you, I guess, different weeks in the course. And as, as usual, uh, or I guess, yeah, it's pretty established that you'll have a lot of drop off in the first few weeks. And we, you know, we looked, is there a difference between uh, these three groups? And we didn't see a, much of a significant difference at all. Uh, you know, not necessarily good, but uh, also not bad, we didn't want to hurt the learner, uh, you know, the drop-off rate. Uh, but we did see an increase in learning gains for, uh, and then we compared this across the two adaptive strategies uh, plus the non-adaptive. And so what we saw was the adaptive strategy that focused on remediation uh, was, uh, led to greater learning gains between a pre uh, a pretest and a post-test. And then second was continuity, and then third was non-adaptive. And then, so this this felt a little intuitive. Where uh, you know, if you're giving people a more adaptive experience, which arguably uh, group A, the, the first algorithm, uh, would do, then maybe that was because um, they're able to practice, and then they're then able to target those problem areas, and then that leads to a greater post-test score afterwards. And so I'll try and speed through some of the upcoming things that we're trying to do with this architecture and uh, how we're using this modular aspect of uh, our architecture to enable a lot of interesting upcoming use cases. Uh, so uh, one interesting thing that I think uh, which we're, we're in the process of utilizing right now, is uh, as a research group at Harvard, we want what we find out online to help out what we do residentially. And so residentially, we actually, we don't use Open edX or edX. Rather, we use another learning management system, Canvas, which many of you may be familiar with. And because this is, you know, at its core, really just an LTI tool, uh, we are able to use this in Canvas as well, uh, while still actually using on the back end the uh, OpenEdX as a content source. Uh, on the content source side, you can imagine having multiple content sources or multiple OpenEdX instances that you are drawing content from. Uh, and lastly, on the engine side, which I think is the most interesting, uh, you can actually think about starting to A-B test between, not just within the engine, which we did, but between different engine systems. So you could say, imagine uh, if you wanted to compare a commercial engine to a open source engine, just to have like some kind of benchmark, you could do that with this kind of uh, architecture. Uh, or if you're trying, if you're you know, a research group and you want to learn about how you know, a certain algorithm uh, works in the uh, course setting, then uh, all you need to do is you don't have to redesign this whole system. Rather, you just focus on purely on the adaptive part. And uh, what you can do is just design just the adaptive logic and uh, while well, not having to design the whole system. Uh, some things also kind of more in progress are uh, the possibility of connecting this to different LTI tools that are also running in the same course. Say if you had a LTI tool that provided a survey about, say, demographic information uh, or learner backgrounds, um, if, if you coordinate with that LTI tool provider, then you could also use that kind of information to personalize your recommendations. Um, you could, uh, speaking to you know, better transparency for instructors and students, uh, because we have this kind of underlying uh, concept of mastery that we track, uh, you could provide uh, 
LTI tool that communicates with the engine to find out what are the mastery levels of, uh, of learners and this, then display that to learners or to instructors in a dashboard setting. And also, I think there's uh, the edX team is thinking a lot about, you know, maybe we can stream out uh, events and have it in this XAPI format so that it's a little bit more interoperable and standardized. And uh, that could be an interesting real-time stream for us to learn about not just uh, uh, problem submissions, but also kind of more fine-grained or different types of learner interactions, like page views or interactions with certain types of activities. So lastly, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people and a lot of organizations. Uh, this was a really collaborative effort over uh, more than a year. Uh, Harvard Reval Research, uh, my group, uh, HarvardX, Colin, uh, people from Microsoft, uh, Raccoon Gang, which has helped a lot with our application development, and uh, TutorGen. So with that, uh, so to summarize, uh, you know, we've built this system for experimentation and evaluation of adaptive learning. Uh, it's, you can use this with multiple engines, multiple content sources, multiple LMSs. And uh, we have some research results. Uh, and lastly, uh, all of this is open source. Uh, you know, of course, Open edX is an open source platform, but all of our other components as well are open. And you can visit the GitHub links here to learn more and hopefully contribute and work with us. So thank you. Uh -huh. So I think it's a good question with not a exact answer, but you can imagine in order for adaptivity to be effective and for an adaptive learning system to have you know different types of content that it can recommend for different types of learners, uh, you know, you you do need a lot of content, and that's definitely a practical barrier for doing adaptive learning in a course. Uh -huh. So there's, you know, again, that really depends on the algorithm. For us, uh, you know, we tag activities with uh, topics. We tag them with difficulty levels. Uh, uh, we tag those, uh, those topics with prerequisites within those as well. There might be other things that I'm forgetting. Uh, so we had about a thousand learners in each of those three groups that kind of completed the whole thing. Uh, time for a couple more. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, can you go back to the study of why you think, I mean, while you're looking for it, I was curious why you didn't do it as a challenge strategy instead of just something you're doing in mitigation. Uh, uh, which slide? Uh, this one. Yes. So how can it have an effect on uh, This was uh, between, this was the difference from the pretest and the post test. Well, yeah, I guess that's a little bit more direct, but. Uh, but it, it's a little, because we have three conditions, right? I think it works a little bit better if you're comparing directly two conditions. Those right? text sizes are so huge that if you really had that in text size, like you'd be making tons of money. So they're enormous for educational strategy. So I don't think they're correct, but anyway, um, you could answer the question maybe about the challenge strategy. Have you thought about that? Mm -hmm. What would you describe as a challenge so strategy?
Uh huh. That's right. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something that's really intriguing to try, and I think we'll definitely try that. How are you? From I wanted to have a, my question is, what's the most common understanding of the definition of adaptive learning? I mean, there's what so many, yeah, so many, uh, so I almost put that in my slides, but then I felt like I would spend like 10 minutes talking about it. But what I see as the difference is, uh, and I guess like personalized learning is oh, pretty popular in terms of like, you know, like Zuckerberg and, and such are funding things like that, but I see personalized learning as you adapting some kind of course con or you having different course content for different learners, and, but adaptive learning is a step beyond that where in real time you are adapting that course content based on things that the learner has just done. Like for example, if you did like a survey uh, uh, before the course, and then, uh, then you directed learners, say, into, say, like, two groups, then, and then had two different, uh, like, kind of content tracks. That would, I'd consider that personalized learning, right? You're, but that's not necessarily adaptive, where you are adapting based on... So, so what I understood at the start of your talk was the problem you were trying to solve for is person data, but you were trying to account for the variability in how people learn and where they're located and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You were trying to account for variability in their backgrounds. Because in the end, the content doesn't change. If I want to test you, your mastery of subject A, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much of adaptability we do, you still have to understand the content of subject A. Uh -huh. is, is that correct? Uh, first of all, was that the problem you were trying to solve for us? So, so that was learning came 20 years ago mm -hmm. when I was teaching Microsoft and Mobile 20 years ago. And then it was not a lot of movement in the area again and it died off. Uh -huh. And then it seems to be making a resurgence, you know, just one uh -huh. Well, I mean, it's, it really comes down to the strategy that you use. And there's just like so many different possible strategies that you can use. Like, for example, that remediation strategy was, you know, we're trying to uh, uh, personalize based on what we see as your uh, competencies at that moment, right? Or you could say, for difficulty strategy, you could say, we're trying to personalize based on the difficulty of the problem versus like your, what we think is your understanding. And, and then there's, so there's, I mean, so many different approaches, and that's why we went with like the sum. The goal was to enable, enable the technology, uh -huh. yeah. and then those who are actually developing various strategies uh -huh. won't need to invest much. They can only invest in developing a strategy and do it. Uh -huh. it. Yeah, like we, we really don't have much of a background in adaptive learning, really. Like, like what we are trying to do is more provide the platform and then you know work with others who are more expert in adaptive learning uh, and lower the barriers for them to write adaptive engines so that we can you know they're able to use that in courses well thank you then want to take it all your oh yeah yeah of course yeah nice to meet you Avi. thanks that was a pretty enlightening talk thanks a lot for that Specifically looking for additional metrics that need to move on the Fantastic. Take some questions. All right. I'm going to have to put a microphone on you.
because you're not gonna hear you in the room. It's for the, the for the week. recording. Yes, exactly. While you're doing that, I've got countdown slides. I'll show this at ten minutes remaining. I'll show this at five minutes remaining. One minute remaining, and then this is the end of your allotted time. Um, so, do you want me to? I've got to time the entire session, but I can also time you uh, based on how many questions you want to answer at the end. I'm just talking about a lot of questions. Okay. So, what's your preference? Do you want me to uh, tell you at the end of the session or with a certain amount of time left for QA? Um, at least five minutes left for QA. I'll be watching my clock on my presentation also okay. and watching my slides and picking a logical place okay. to stop. Okay, so five minutes of QA. I'll display this when you've got five minutes total left. And yep. That'll be your QA. Q Right. Is this the extending open edX with other systems? Um, this is extending open edX. With, or integration with enterprise systems. Perfect. I'm in the right room. Yep. So uh, do you need to present from your own laptop? Yes, from my own laptop. Let's uh, make the here. Yeah. So I'm thinking we'll go full nuclear on this. I have all the dongles and all the cables. So we're just going to get everything out and see what works. Did you have a co as well? Hmm? Did you have a I did. Unfortunately, Sam is not able to make it up here with us. So it's just me. Yes. <laughs> I get to take all the heat myself. You know, it should be fine. Um, I actually revised the title a little bit after I started creating my slides. Instead of with your enterprise systems, it's more going to be a review of how we've done things with lessons learned about you know, what worked, what didn't work, um, and what could be improved. Right, so is this? We're here. We can set up. Goodell. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the camera is filming, it's starting over here. Okay. So you can pass over there. Just the, the other side of the lectern. Okay, good. That's fine. All right, welcome everybody. I would like to introduce Jason Goodell from Global Knowledge, and he is here to talk about extending open edX to support enterprise systems. So welcome, Jason. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation. Um, 
I was supposed to co-present with Sam Boyarski, one of my co-workers at Global Knowledge. Unfortunately, he was not able to come and join us. So I'm here all by myself to take all the heat and all the glory. Um, I'm a Python developer that specializes in server-side development. I've worked with Django for many years. I actually just spoke with a colleague that I worked with many years ago who's in the previous session. Um, as you can tell, I have changed the title slightly. I took the your out. Um, what I realized when compiling all this information was this was not going to be an authoritative, this is how you do it. It was more going to be a review of how we at Global Knowledge did the integration, lessons learned, um, warts and all. And I've got a lot of content, so I'm going to get started. I probably won't cover all of the integrations we've done, but I'm going to start with probably the biggest and most important one which was getting our records into OpenEdX because OpenEdX was not going to be the system of record for our users or for our enrollments. So first I'd like to get started with just taking a moment to talk about the different graphics I'm going to be using. I didn't follow a more standard format. Um, so we'll talk about these briefly. The green arrows are for indicating request and response objects or requests over HTTP. Uh, solid blue objects are other systems in the environment where OpenEdX exists. Blue fade are OpenEdX instances. Um, the red cylinders we all know and love are database systems. The turquoise portions are the additions of, that we created for the integrations themselves. So these are things like APIs, X blocks, and other things that we developed to integrate OpenEdX with our enterprise systems. And gray was for everything else that I didn't have time to pick a color. I just picked a shape and put some words on it. So to get started, to appreciate how we did things at, with OpenEdX at Global Knowledge, you need to understand the constraints that we were working with. So as I mentioned earlier, um, OpenEdX was not going to be the system of record for us, especially when it came to users or student contacts and enrollments. We have other modalities of learning in the company that we support, including instructor-led and virtual instructor-led that run off the same back office systems for all of our enrollments and registrations. So we needed to get that information into edX. So one of the first point being is that open edX was going to be delegated to as far as information it was going to have on enrollments and users. Um, this included the user records and how these would migrate from open edX's back office into or Global Knowledge's back office into open edX. Um, doing this, we wanted to mitigate risk that we would incur when changes happen um, in the open edX platform. You know, we weren't looking to manage our own patches over the open edX core. We were going to try a more modular plug-in type um, approach to getting our changes in. So I will outline that most of that in this talk that we were also going to push the information. We weren't going to pull it. We weren't going to wait for an event on the open edX side to pull in users' information regarding their records, whether it be their user records or their enrollments. Um, so we decided to have some landing tables. Um, I'll talk about what event was actually going to drive this process when we get to it a little bit later. I'll start with an environmental overview to give you a, a large view idea of where open edX fits in in our enterprise, what systems surround it, and what systems it's communicating with in the process of being um, an LMS for global knowledge. The integration largely for us happens behind our firewall. We have two instances of open edX running, one of which is private facing, which sits behind our firewall, which we use for all of our internal traffic. Um, if someone needs to go into the CMS for any reason. We also don't do most of our authoring in the CMS, but there are cases where we do need to go in and work with the CMS to create changes within courses that are live. So that our private facing instance handles that. There's a public facing instance that handles all of our traffic for all of our students and users. We have another two systems in our environment that OpenEdX interacts with heavily. One of those is MyGK, that is the landing site and the face of global knowledge for our company on the web. Um, it's where all of our traffic goes through and eventually winds up at the learning platform if someone has chosen to take a course on OpenEdX for us and we call 
uh, open edX for us, the learning platform. And then there are back office systems, which is a much larger set of other entities within our environment, things like sales logics, our um, data warehouse, uh, operational data store that is in the process of being created, and many other things. There's a bi-directional flow of information between my GK and our back office. Changes that we make in our back office are represented as new features or tiles in the my GK platform, which is a C sharp application. So we have a heterogeneous environment on top of the other parts of complexity that we have. Um, and additionally, if a user creates a change when interacting with my GK, that information goes back to our back office. Finally, we have an identity server instance, which we will also use to integrate um, OpenEdX in for our authentication authorization purposes using SSO. Um, OpenEdX has facilities for integration with third-party identity um, management, and we took advantage of that at our company to create a single sign-on solution. So somebody signs into MyGK, um, they'll also be signed into OpenEdX, which uh, using the same credentials. And when they're forwarded from the site, it's not completely seamless, but it's not a confusion as to what credentials should I use. It's the same set of credentials. And once the accounts are linked, if they're logged in on one, they will be logged in on the other. And as you can see, the identity server works for MyGK and all the other systems, including OpenEdX. Now, it's events in our data warehouse when a new registration is created or an enrollment for a student that drives the migration of information from our back office into OpenEdX. What happens is an event or trigger in the database triggers an event that ultimately comes from MyGK that sends a request over with the record for the user and all of their enrollments to our private facing instance of OpenEdX. That traffic goes through a web API, which we designed that sits on the private instance. And that API takes all of our traffic for bringing all of the records over. First stop, we'll be talking about the migration of these records. Without getting these records into OpenEdX, there's really no way for our users to take courses in OpenEdX. We have to know the course. We have done something slightly different with we have a rolling time-based window for access to the course. When we create a course in OpenEdX, it runs in perpetuity, but a user may only have access for a 90 to 360-day window. So that information comes over with the record and winds up getting into a set of landing tables on the OpenEdX side. So the first thing we need to do is sit down and talk about how this resource was going to be defined to be sent over to OpenEdX. And we decided that the Definition would be JSON-based. Um, it seems to be the lingua franca of sending resources over the web at this point. So um, because the system we were communicating with was also C-sharp, having a definition that was not dependent on the technology used for the implementation of the web application seemed to be the best way to go. Um, this is a course resource. It's not finely grained, so it contains also not only the user's information, but it also contains all information about the enrollments that go over to OpenEdX. The record is also atomic. It sends everything when there is an update. So if we had a situation, and we did have a situation where we needed to create, recreate most of the user records, we can just recycle these through the API and we get all of our landing tables back. And I had a little pseudo graphic of what that JSON structure looks like in our system. It's been amended, actually, since I created this graphic with one new attribute for the enrollments. But you can see the user information is the first set of attributes and then a list of enrollment objects below that. We take this JSON in on the OpenEdX side through our API and process that to create the records in our landing table and drive the process, which creates the OpenEdX native users and enrollments in the edX tables. The web API definition, if you're familiar with REST, you should see some attributes here that are very familiar to you. First of all, we use bookmarkable URLs. This has several benefits for us. First of all is 
it leads us towards an idiomatic use of HTTP. We don't have actions coded in our URLs. We use the methods that are defined by HTTP, meaning that when we get a record, we use get. When we create a record, we use post. Or if we don't know if we're creating or updating, we use put. Um, in this case, we're using put. And we also constrain the API to make sure that everything we get is JSON and send the appropriate error record back to whatever system contacts us. Um, there is a possibility we could have other systems within our company that could be talking to us, and we all need to make sure that we're sending the same record definition across at all times using the same um, type. And as I mentioned earlier, the idiomatic use of HTTP methods. So the, we don't have to define custom error messages when something fails for authentication reasons. We get a 401. When there's a fatal conflict or error in a record that we cannot process, it's a 403. Um, we made use of a 409, which is a conflict, which was a very important error code for our scenario in that our data wasn't entirely clean. There are instances where um, we not only use a contact ID, but we use an email to identify our users. And sometimes, especially if they have accounts across multiple countries in Europe, they may have a slightly different email address with the same contact ID between two countries. That raises a flag for us in the form of a 409 error that says someone needs to go and look at this record if it doesn't clear eventually. Because sometimes we will get information adjusted in our back office that will allow the request to finally go through without a conflict. But sometimes we need to go through and audit those by hand and make sure that we're consolidating the records in our back office correctly. The web API implementation, we decided you know, it should be a Django 1.8 application. We're using these basically as plugins. A Django app, if you're familiar with Python programming, is a Python package with, by convention, modules of certain names that allow for an interface so that you can just go and create um, your own applications. And that's how we decided to do a lot of our work when extending OpenEdX. We use the REST framework package that most of OpenEdX uses for doing a lot of its own API work so that we were consistent across the rest of the open edX code as far as how we were implementing things. So there wouldn't be a big change there. As again, also Python package installable. Our operations support, a wonderful gentleman by the name of Jody has automated almost everything that we've done at this point. And making these extensions, Python package installable, made his life a lot easier. He doesn't have to put that Django app in a specific location on the server, he can just pip install it into location and not have to worry about making sure that it's in the correct subdirectory of the um, open edX structure. Uh, a lot of this is integration through configuration. So we weren't having to make many changes to the open edX code. It was things like URL files and settings files where we would map our URLs and make sure that we had all the settings correct for our application to run. And then something which should be obvious, but I wanted to mention anyways, is there's a, with our APIs, we were going to be conflicting with existing URLs in OpenEdX. So we needed to make sure that we created a namespace for our URLs to work in without causing any collisions. So we prepend all of our URLs with GK API. So because we have things like enrollments and other URLs that would conflict with what is currently in the namespaces used by open edX. We depend on open edX. We try not to make open edX depend on us as far as code changes went. So we import packages from open edX to do the work, especially the integration of native user and enrollment records. That means that when a change does happen that is not backwards compatible with what we have done, we would be responsible for upgrading our changes and making sure they work before we roll to production and we didn't have to go in and do any other work with regard to making changes to the open edX core code. So now we'll take a look at what happens when an event is triggered and a record actually makes it over to our custom API. The first thing that happens is our landing tables are used to see what is the current state of this record if it does exist. If it does exist, is this an update? Is this just an addition of a new enrollment? All that is worked out by taking a look at the um, landing tables that are on the database and figuring out, is it clean? Is it a 403? Is it a 409? If it's successful and a create or an update happens, we send back the appropriate status code. If a 
conflict happens, part of the record may be written to our landing tables, and we would send back a specific error message with the 409 stating what part of the record failed or caused the conflict. A 403 or is completely fatal, it means that nothing was processed on our API's end, and it talks to the upstream system saying, hey, there's a problem with this. Create a log message, handle the error the way it's supposed to be handled. The creating and updating is probably the one graphic here that I have the biggest problem with as far as I don't think it really explains exactly what I wanted to do, but I'll work with it here for a moment. So as a Django app, it's got URL configuration, so it has the mappings for our URLs. We have the view portion, and then we have application logic and controller, which we encapsulate outside of the view. So we're using the Django REST framework to handle our request and response transactions, but all of the other logic we have outside of those views and other functions and objects. And it's in those functions and objects that we depend on the open edX code. So we tried to keep our exposure to the open edX code as small as possible so that we would know we'd have a relatively small number of lines of code that we would have to dig through to make sure that we were still compatible when changes came up. And as you can see, all of those um, dependencies come in as imports at the top of the module file. So this is, this is nothing new if you're a seasoned Python developer. And that tells pretty much the story of how we get the, the documents into OpenEdX. Once we have these migrated documents regarding users and enrollments, we can do many other things with OpenEdX as far as customizing it for global knowledge's use. I'll go over a few of those here, and we'll see what time we have as far as going over those in details. Um, one of the other things we did with APIs was adding functionality via AJAX. Um, we had use, especially on the My Courses page, to change how the My Courses page behaved in certain circumstances, especially regarding how we viewed enrollments at Global Knowledge, which is a rolling time window base. If somebody enrolls with, on a course on April 1st and it's for 90 days, they should have 90 days of access to that course. So our enrollment definition is different than Open edX's enrollment definition, which is when a course starts, you have your enrollment roster, that course starts, and somebody takes that course for the spring semester. Our use case is different. But we also did things like um, custom endpoints for forwarding student communications. We had a requirement where we needed our students to be able to talk to or communicate with their mentors. So we used a page, a tab on the um, course homepage to create a small application that relayed a message to SMTP. So somebody could write a message to their mentor. We would take it and on the server side relay it to the mentor's email address. We did the same thing for um, support contacts for individuals that may have, for some reason, not been able to get into open edX on our systems. We wanted them to have a way to go directly to our help desk without having to go to another MyGK or Global Knowledge system to get that message through. And that is an email address that's monitored by our help desk folks. As I mentioned, also, we had a single sign-on and third-party authentication integration. Um, that was probably one of the more challenging of the smaller integrations because our identity server was custom rolled. It wasn't a commercial product. So we had to spend a lot of time with the contractor developers that designed that identity server system to get all of this to work. Open edX's implementation was surprisingly very, very clean. It was getting our in-house solution up to snuff so that we could get the integration to roll properly. We also did a lot of work with custom X blocks. Um, we created a, an Xbox for integrating Vimeo player integration. Um, we had a business requirement. We couldn't use YouTube. Um, if somebody gets a hold of the YouTube URL, even if it's one that's been obfuscated, they can technically still get to the video, while Vimeo, on the other hand, had a stronger authentication. So we went ahead and um, used our contractors to do that implementation integrated into the platform. We also did custom labs integrations using X-Blocks, um, a custom sequencing X-Block, and a custom matrix X-Block. 
And looking at my time, I think I've got enough time to go over the APIs for AJAX functionality. And I'll go through this one quickly. The API definition is going to be very, very familiar to what we've already talked about. It's a series of URLs. They're also bookmarkable. Um, this left does let, leave a very nice little audit trail. When you have the contact information in your logs timestamp because it's in the URLs, it's very easy to go back and look and see, well, when was the last communication for this contact or this record in our logs? Look for stack traces or other errors in those logs and find out what the root cause may be for any issue. So it was a, a real win-win on top of being able to use these to permanently address a record within our extension to the system. So if you send a message to mentor contacts with a specific contact ID and course ID, you're always going to be writing to that record or reading from that record. Or you would get a 404 saying that record did not exist if you were trying to retrieve it. Again, constrained to application JSON and made idiomatic use of HTTP methods so we didn't have to custom code any actions into our URLs or create any additional error messaging back and forth between our client and our server. It was all you know, ready and there for us to take advantage of. The implementation was also very similar. Django 1.8 compliant app, uh, Python package installable, integration through configuration, URL mapping that was namespaced under GK API. Um, because this API sits outside our firewall, we did have authentication. Um, to think about. So we used the CSRF token and the Django authentication for making sure that whoever's talking to these endpoints is authenticated, unless it's that one uh, custom contact endpoint where we need people that aren't authenticated to be able to contact our help desk saying, hey, I can't get in, or there's another issue with my account. Similar graphic to before, or graphic to before you have your URL, URL routing, you have your view, you have some application logic, and in this case, we have a model, especially with the messages for the contact and the support. We wanted to make sure that we kept a record of those and didn't just send them out over SMTP without taking note of them in our systems so that we would have a record in case somebody was taking a course for a big promotion and did not get credit for it and did not get their promotion and then say to us, well, I had a problem with this section and I sent a message. What happened to it? We would have that message on our system and be able to say whether or not they sent it. I added this graphic to talk about this last approach, about how it helps us, especially in the context of the My Courses page, to add content to an existing page in Open edX without having to create changes in the Open edX core and maintain them against the code base. So when a user does a request for a page in a Django application to make a synchronous request over to the server side, which builds the context inside of the view and sends a rendered template back to the client. What the use of the AJAX APIs does is we can add JavaScript into the template for the theming that will talk to our endpoint adding additional content. So we can emerge a progress status bar on the My Courses page, which is something we did do, a custom progress bar that would show um, a user's progress within a course at a granularity that was more in line with what we had shown in our other offerings for online courses. The other important part of this is knowing if you haven't done any theme work is where to go find the themes once you've created the API. Um, Find the template in the code base or create a copy of it where you need to, to to extend the theme. Add the JavaScript that makes the call to the server side to get the additional information. Add JavaScript to update the DOM on that page to get the desired effect. In our case, it was a, a progress status bar. And here's a screenshot of what our system looks like. If you can see it, we have a, that's our custom progress bar where we used this approach to get information back to an existing open edX page without having to do any work on the view for that page. And I think I will stop right there. Take any questions.
So if I go much farther, I think I'll run out of time for taking questions. We, yes, definitely. Um, the question was with the AJAX APIs, how does it impact performance? We did have a real performance problem with the My Courses page, um, a couple of instances. I can't speak in depth about the work that was done there. It was done by Sam, actually, who's not here. But we had to, Sam and one of the other contractors, um, really be careful with how we were adding additional information to that page. I can't remember what they did on the server side at the moment to make sure that that progress um, bar shows, but they basically had to do a lot of pre-calculation of that progress. They could not do that in real time and store that progress information for display when the page was pulled up. Because what originally was happening with the implementation was when the My Courses page would come up, for each course that that person had on their My Courses page, an individual calculation was having to be made of the progress. We found a way to store that information on the server side and just recall it without having to do the calculation. So yes, performance was an issue, especially in that specific instance for using AJAX. It did hit a wall. But otherwise, we haven't experienced any real performance issues with small things. Just recalling some additional content that's already in the database to display on the page hasn't been an issue. Also, the My Courses page, as I said, because we have that rolling time window based on when somebody buys a course with Global Knowledge, whether or not that course is shown as active where somebody can actually select it and enter the course is calculated in real time via AJAX when the page is pulled up, and that hasn't really caused us any issues. Yep, my pleasure. You two are simultaneous. <laughs> I can add them where they're applicable, especially the first portion of this talk was all server-side integration. So there wasn't going to be any um, We've discussed that. Um, because most of them are really specific to our business needs, we didn't think that they would really be of much use. And the question he asked was, would we make the Django applications we've developed for these purposes open source? If I could find a way where I thought that they would be really reusable, I would definitely be pushing for that more. But most of them are very specific to our definitions for our business uses. Um, to be honest, most of them weren't very complex to build. We purposely tried to keep the complexity low on a lot of these projects because we had a pretty aggressive timeline for going to um, production with the product. Probably the most complex, like I said, was the SSO integration, which took a lot of work between our group that did the identity server integration and the already existing integration for um, third-party authentication within OpenEdX. But for the API apps, they were pretty straightforward. And a lot of the logic was, and there's one part, unfortunately, I, did, I'm not, I didn't get a chance to talk about here because it wasn't directly applicable to OpenEdX, was is we, need to ha we needed to have an asynchronous disconnect between our back office and OpenEdX. So we actually have a service that sits in between them called the garden, which 
uses an asynchronous messaging queue to take the information or the requests that are coming from our back office, queue them up, and then manage the further push of them into open edX. That, I think, is something that would be very interesting in the open source community as to how we managed to do that because it was a, an 11th hour we need to do this because, as Michelle brought up, we realized that if we did a just-in-time um, enrollment of users into their courses, especially when they bought a 60-course bundle, under the best circumstances, somebody could be waiting two minutes for that page to load if we did all those enrollments in real time. So the asynchronous queue taking the message from the event that happens in our data warehouse gave us about a 20 minute lead time when somebody enrolls via, or I believe it's Michelle, it's purchased by credit card where that scenario comes in. If somebody purchased courses by credit card, they get immediate access at global knowledge. That gives us a 20 minute lead time before in the MyGK application, the tile appears, which gives them access to open edX and brings everything around. So that service in between was performant enough to within that 20 minute window when the request came through to get all the information in there. So when somebody saw the tile and the link inside my GK and went to go enter edX for the first time, they would be let in and see all of their courses. The only caveat to that was is if a 403 or a 409 happened because of issues with our data in our back office. Um, we keep track of contacts with people. We don't necessarily dedupe at a contact down to a specific user. And that is something that we're continuing to work on that has caused us some problems. Because as I said, we may have somebody that works out of the France, an office in France and an office in Belgium and our European partners. And they may have two different email addresses but the same contact ID or two different contact IDs with the same email address. That causes a conflict on the open edX side where we would have to either get that record collapsed in our back office or do some work to the resource to get it to go into open edX smoothly. They would either have to know they have to manage two separate accounts or if we couldn't collapse them. Yep. And we've got three minutes left. I saw that during the keynote, and I think we all exchanged a little smile where we were sitting because we've had to do something very similar with previous releases to get that feature to work for global knowledge. And what he was asking or commented on was is that there's going to be a progress API coming up in Hawthorne that we'll probably wind up making use of. Future plans. Um, right now, there isn't a lot going on other than trying to fully move into the platform at Global Knowledge. So we've got a, historically a lot of course content to deliver. Some things that have been talked about are, and that we've done on our own, are reporting. We need to get information out of Open edX back into our back office so that we can create things like um, reminders to users that have enrolled in a course that, hey, you've got 30 days left or 14 days left. Right now, we're doing a lot of that by hand. People have to go in and look at the enrollment records on the other side in our back office and figure out how things are going. We would like to have a more robust reporting structure where we're pulling information out and automatically generating these reports every night so that when somebody comes in, they can look and see the batch of individuals that need to be contacted because, hey, it's 14 days. Yep. Great. And I think we're about there. Probably time for one quick question. No? Well, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed it and it was informative. Great. Thank you. No problem. My pleasure. Before I walk off with this. John. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I have to go move a van that's going to be illegally parked at 3 p.m.
so <laughs> it was too tall for the garage, so we couldn't park in the garage. hoping I could ask Jason, but uh, sure, Jason too. He, you have a system of record uh, that's different than the one I'm dealing with, so you, you didn't come across the problem I'm going to ask you about, <laughs> which is what you do when you have a name collision, like you have someone who's uh, arriving through SSO who already has an account. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. We've had that happen. <laughs> oh, you have had that happen. That's why you have a system of record. <laughs> yes. Uh, we do a lot of manual do things and and fixing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, so uh, on the garden system that I mentioned, there is a very small very user interface that mm -hmm. allows my boss and our operations person to go in and take a look at those. And troubleshoot goes without disturbing engineering mm -hmm. all the time. <laughs> and um, talk to you. It's especially our um, presence in media that has that problem countries taking courses between multiple locales mm. and that one was a collision for us. Yeah. And, that up. and it usually means that one of the records needs to be deleted so that the other can pass through properly and then
will be the can ear us. Okay, and there's going to be potentially two of us. So would both of us be mic'd, or do I just hand it over to the other person? Uh, I have the second one if we need it. I can. I'll talk for a bit and then. Okay. I can just put it in my pocket. Yeah. Okay. And is it already on? Yes, it is. Okay, am I broadcasting now? Yes. That's fine. <laughs> so you're using your own computer? Yes. Here. And the camera is filming, it's starting over here. Over here? So you can pass the, 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 the whiteboard. It's like kind of the limit there. Okay. And uh, it's going over here. Okay. So you have to kind of change it. Okay. Cool. Hi, can you hear me? Testing, one, two, three. Perfect. Okay. Hey, Jesus. All right. Not bad. I guess I'm, oh yeah, I'm up there too. Cool. Can you try sharing your webcam? We'll just do the pre-demo demo. All right, perfect. All right, so um, awesome. If there's, uh, if you could get uh, two of the other students to join you as well, or they have to create a they have to, hold on hold on uh can you log into the uh yeah don't worry about it it's good enough jesus i have a screenshot with many people sharing so i'm going to leave and i'll just slack you when it comes time to do the demo All right. okay cool so it would be okay to share the microphone with the other person yes It's the other person, they, they can't like stand close to me. I have to give them the microphone. Uh, yeah, if they're close to you, we can, we can hear the, the other. <laughs> okay. okay, no worries. I'm, I'm sorry, or I... No, 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 it'll work out. Okay. Great, Thank you. thanks. Hey, no, no, that's okay. We are filling in the gap. I will not take it personally. We know it's streaming online to millions of people. Uh, hey, you may find out some stuff about it. I'm not there sure. Might be people who come they think think it's is that, yeah. So what we can do, it is streaming live, so it will be recorded. Uh, I have about 20 slides we can go through, we can talk about it, and then maybe we'll spurn some conversation later on. But you can also see what we're doing. Is there someone who's gonna know to start that thing? It's already starting and broadcasting. Yeah, we're broadcasting now. So, yeah, so I think, I think we just start at uh, 3.15, we talk for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then we're good. Should we plant someone in the audience to ask questions? Uh, <laughs> yeah, hang on. Stop doing a I think I'm just gonna get, open the door. I tweeted about it. If you want to retweet it, oh sure. Uh, FF Dixon. Hi. Uh, that's gonna work. 
So just to let you know, there was a session that was originally scheduled on video, but we're going to fill in and do some talk about uh, integration of Big Blue Button, which is a web-based video collaboration system, into edX. So the theme is the same, but the idea is looking at bringing real-time collaboration into edX. So you're welcome to stand. You would be our, you would be like our main audience person. Oh, we'll see. Who else comes? So yeah, the whole idea is increasing the collaboration with edX. We'll give it a few more minutes and I'll shut the door and we'll go. So it got on the sketch. It did. So we, we have uh, one microphone between us. Come on in. Just to let you know, this was a session that was scheduled on video. Uh, uh, that's right. Yep, so uh, the folks can't show up, but uh, we're going to do a session that's based on increasing collaboration. We have, uh, I'm the product manager for Big Blue Button, which is an open source web conferencing system for sharing video, audio, slides. Okay. And we've been working with AppSembler to integrate it with edX. Oh, so you're welcome to join us. Is this yes, it is. It is. Okay. I'm gonna help you guys by introducing people. Sure. Helping repeat questions and your designated helper person. And is this for folks who are online or um, folks who are in the room? I think it's like I introduce the speaker. Sure. I you guys I think have thirty five minutes. We will probably talk for fifteen minutes or so and then open it up and see where we go from there. And I can also help repeat questions or whatever you guys want. Okay. I'm Olga. Olga, I'm Fred. Nice to meet Hi, you. Fred, nice to meet you. I am Nate. Nate, I think we've met we several times. I think we've met at edX, yeah. Yes. I think I was there uh, and you're, you're at edX? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see yeah, you again. Nice to see you too. And um, I actually don't know what talk. Is this a replacement talk? It is a replacement talk. So you can just basically describe it as um, we are exploring ways to increase collaboration oh. in open edX uh, using a... Okay a web conferencing system that um, we've developed and we've been working with Nate at AppSembler to integrate. Uh, or is that the editable slides? Yeah, we can edit them. Uh, last my, name. My, my last name is misspelled. All right. <laughs> and there's no, it's not a capital S, it's just a lowercase s. Okay, so, okay. A -U -N -E. Just remove the first, yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. Cool, yes. good catch. So it used to be one on video, but we're going to oh, do so one. there's no description here. No, it, actually the description's online. If you want to look at the schedule, you can see it. Uh -huh. um, but you can introduce it as looking at increasing the collaboration in Open edX, which is exactly what we're going to explore and talk about. Okay. I might even be able to bring it up here. Uh, so big, big blue button. My name is Amanda. Nice to see you. Yeah. Hi. Come on in. No, I'm just here to make sure that all goes taken care of. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a little tricky getting people in the room here because it's not on stage. It is. It's okay. Yeah, We're going to be streaming. We're going to replace and fill in. Oh, our pleasure. Uh, 
Are you turning anything on that or is someone else doing it? Uh, that was what uh, I was asked to do. But what is she asking? I didn't see. Oh, that was me. That oh. was me. I was oh. asking if you were going to be here. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I have a bunch of slides going through the big blue button. Uh, things that we can do in edX, use cases. I do a demo and just turn around and talk about possible things that we can do next. Uh, we've got one microphone between us. Do you want to speak first in terms of like, um, you know, yourself? I'm sure they all know you, but do you want to talk about, you know, how there's options, there's always been opportunities for collaboration to complement edX, but nothing's really been deeply. It's always been tell, Tell people to go to some external tool. Right. We could build something into it um, for tutoring, for student collaboration, for video assignment submission, even like smallish online classes. Mm -hmm. And then we can get data from that collaboration back in edX for uh, assignment completion, for part of the, um, the data that's being gathered already. Yeah, I can just say a few words about that. Okay, and then I can give a demo. I can talk about it and just... So I'm gonna give this to you so that you get picked up. <laughs> That got broadcasted too. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I should be standing here. Okay. But now people can't see the slides. Oh, but actually, it's oh, it's right there. Yeah, cool. yeah. Right. So this is like yeah, they've got screens all over the place. <coughs> should I mention that this is not the session that people might think it is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. What time is it supposed to start? 15. Oh, so we can start right now. Right? Will you introduce us first, I presume? Will you, will you be introducing us? Or? Yes. Okay. Um, should we start? It might be like a, yeah. a more close space. Okay, so as most of you know, edX is a really great platform for delivering content, um, but when it comes to collaboration between students, between faculty, uh, there aren't that many built-in capabilities. You have the discussion forums, you have peer grading, you have a few other vehicles you can use, but there isn't really a rich, interactive, real-time environment where students can collaborate. And so what we want to talk about in the session is how you can increase collaboration through video chat, through whiteboard sharing, from small groups. Um, and the use cases are like you know, mentoring, coaching, small groups. Uh, these are things that are hard to do in a MOOC scale. If you have 50,000 students in a class, it's pretty hard to do that type of collaborative work. But if, you're, uh, if you have smaller class sizes, you know, 20, 30, 50 people, um, this is a really great way to kind of simulate what happens in a classroom like this, right? Um, where you can have video chat, you can have breakdown sessions, and really increase the engagement in your classes and make it um, more like being in a, in a real classroom. So there's a number of different tools that are out there. We're gonna talk about one today that Fred's company um, has built. It's an open source platform called Big Blue Button. And then uh, after he's done presenting, we can kind of open it up for, for questions and talk about um, what types of collaborative tools you guys are, are excited and interested in. So during the keynote this morning, they talked about uh, hybrid schools. You know, would you go to a session before you go to the school? Would you go to a session during the school? Would you go to a session after the school? And if you wanted to simulate or on-ramp people, 
there is an opportunity for collaboration. So I wear the product management. Nate is with AppSembler. I'm uh, the product manager for Big Blue Button, which is an open source uh, web conferencing system for online learning. Let me ask, how many people have heard of Big Blue Button before? Okay, everybody, great. Nobody can see you online, so I just, I just made that up. Um, we've actually been around the market for over eight years. We are built into Canvas, we're built into Schoology, we're built into Genzabar. We're the fifth most downloaded plugin on the Moodle website, and we're built into Sakai as well as the meeting tool. And this is open source, so it has been used and hardened for many years. In terms of what the capabilities are, if you think of a traditional web conferencing system, and you're going to, let's say, ask people in edX to go use Google Hangouts, right? And then they're gone, and then they come back later on. We do very similar things where it's real-time sharing of audio, video, slides, chat, desktop, emojis, collaborative whiteboard. Very easy to collaborate back and forth. You can, if you want to share, 15 webcams. Uh, the product is evolving over the last couple of years. This is a snapshot of what we've been working on. Pure HTML5 client. I have it running here on my phone as well. And you can actually do very interactive collaboration. So there's an example of two people sort of doing together, uh, working on a math problem. Just in terms of like who else has been using Big Blue Button, the largest deployment on the planet is actually the US Department of Defense. They got rid of a proprietary system about four years ago, and they shifted over to a completely um, homegrown infrastructure that was based at Big Blue Button at the core. So they run dozens of servers with thousands of simultaneous users spread across hundreds of meetings. And that was built on the open source project. Uh, the project itself is doing a lot of growth, lots of forks, uh, over 80 committers. Uh, all, all the code there is on GitHub. Uh, we're making use of the latest web technologies for WebRTC. That's audio and video. And more recently, both Firefox and Chrome will allow you to share your screen as well. We take accessibility very important. And this is me with my product management hat on. We want people to be able to use it. We want to be accessible. So every release, we have an external company that comes in, audits the open source project, gives us a statement of accessibility. Um, and how many people have heard of GDPR? Yes, I'm sure everybody, right? So we recently added tools to our open source project where uh, if you have a request for what personal information you have on a data subject, you can run this tool. We'll go through all the recordings and find out all the data that are in the recordings. And because we keep the event level data, like if Nate and I were in a session, the system knows what I'm talking. If I stop talking and Nate talks, it knows that Nate's talking. So we've set up a tool so we could actually pull out all the events for a user and mask out all their audio. So just put, what, put a silence there so we could regenerate the recording and exactly take the person out of it in terms of the right to be forgotten. So trying to make sure we play well with the standards and requirements out there. Um, in terms of collaboration, we did breakout rooms we put in two years ago. Uh, Multi-user whiteboard was really good for collaboration, like tutoring or that. Uh, I heard the word tutoring this morning in one of the presentations. The idea was if you're going to have students go online, they're going to do a course, they're going to complete some assignments, there could be um, some support provided by the institution for tutoring. And maybe that is a revenue generation support as well. So maybe they, the student could pay a little bit to get a uh, uh, someone to tutor them for a little bit. Most people find that you know, it's good to have a little bit of collaboration. I remember in my years of learning, whenever I had a problem, I would go talk to the instructor or professor. 10 minutes was all I needed. I was off to go. Um, we have been working on uh, statistics as well. So when you go into a session, right now, if you were to send someone from edX to uh, an external application, they're gone. You have no idea what they did. You have no idea how long they were there. With our system, because we're keeping the events, and this was, goes back to like GDPR and be able to remove the data, we know how long a person was there. We know if they spoke, they talked, if they raised their hand, they shared an emoji, or if they did polling. And what we've done recently is we've been taking all that data and making it available so we could give it back to a third party system or to an LMS and tell them what the students did. So if you had an edX course and you wanted to have um, keep track of tutoring, or if you wanted to do so provide students a way to collaborate, or there was a group project, and that group project was part of their commitment to the course. They had to do something with other students. Uh, you, we could actually give that data back to edX, and edX could track that they had actually been together. So 
Uh, when Nate and I were putting this together, we sort of looked at some use cases. These are the ones that drive our open source project. So we're not trying to do a video conferencing system for businesses in petroleum industry. We think about online learning. And these are the use cases. So I kind of put the ones in bold, which I thought probably map a bit more to edX. Definitely tutoring, student to student collaboration, um, a video assignment submission, um, and an online class. And large here is kind of quotation marks. We've, we've had sessions which are up to 250 people in a big blue button session. But just to be upfront, we're not trying to solve the problem of how do I stream live to 10,000 people. That problem has been solved by other systems. We think that the pyramid is a lot more richer at the, at the smaller group where you can engage students uh, or they can be engaged with each other a lot more interactively. So the, the one person talking and that's the only person who can talk, not quite the model we're trying to solve. But we do scale up to about 250, which covers a lot of use cases. So I'm gonna do a demo of the integration. So this is with help. Um, Nate and I have been collaborating together and we've got something which is using one of their servers and I'm going to Slack one of our guys. Okay, join. So, uh, yeah, if you can, if you can, uh, so we set it up on, I can Slack you it or? Uh, it's too long. <laughs> okay, so what I've got in front of me here is we basically went on to um, App Assembler's hosted environment. We set up an account and we created a course. In the course, we created uh, some content. One of them was a unit, and we used, in this case, the LTI integration. So uh, we've got a student collaboration assignment here. And if I click on it, what I'm seeing now is our system coming up with inside of edX. And what is it showing? It's showing that I can join a session, so if whoever has access to this unit can join it, and these are the recordings from the previous session. So if I join, this is now gonna load Big Blue Button. So I can join with my microphone. There's no app to install, it's pure HTML5. Let's see, test, test, there we go. Okay, so uh, immediately I could share a webcam and then other people could see me online. So I just slacked, okay, join. I just slacked one of my coworkers. So inside this session, I could be doing uh, whiteboard. I can be doing chat. So if, you, if all of us were in a session, you know, we could be doing it together, say hi. All of this could be recorded later on. So if this was part of the collaboration where we wanted to do a project together, maybe there were some people who couldn't join it, they could watch the recording afterwards. This is all happening with an edX. Um, okay, cool. Hey, Seuss and some of our other folks at the, the uh, office are gonna join. So what I asked them to do was come in and just share their webcam so you could sort of see the visual side of it. All right, perfect. And I'm just gonna swap the webcams here and let's just go to full screen and I'll hide the chat for a moment. Hey guys, can you hear me? Hey. So I believe you're being streamed live on YouTube right now, and uh, we're actually here in a group. So just wanted to say thanks for joining. Yes. Uh, so I'm gonna do, uh, in terms of obviously we can share audio, we can do webcams. If I swap, I'm gonna turn on multi-user whiteboard. So if I uploaded a presentation, we could all be working on it together. Uh, we, do the, we use Big Blue Button to design Big Blue Button. So when it comes time to work with our graphic designers, we end up uploading the designs here. We all share the whiteboard and we move around. And again, this is recorded. If I want to record, I could do start recording. And then all the webcams, everything we're doing in the interaction, the audio, video, basically everything you see is being shared. And I am going to say, okay guys, that's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign out, thanks for coming in. Actually, before I do that, does anybody have any questions of what they saw so far? Uh, yep, so their webcam stopped, they just left. So there's no more stream, so it just showed that there was no more stream. Uh, so we actually are sending the audio and video through two separate streams. For the video, we're using Corento, which is an open source uh, WebRTC selected forwarding unit server, SFU. And for audio, we're using FreeSwitch, 
which is a really good uh, soft switch. So everything you see here is open source. You can go back and install this on a computer uh, if you want. Uh, just go to bigbluebutton.org and you'll see the downloads for it. There's a server that's up and running called test.bigbluebutton.org where you can go to with your phone and then log on with your tablet. You can see the latest builds of our HTML5 client. There's quite a few people working on this. We just recently had a developer summit four weeks ago in Toronto. We had 18 developers working for a whole week on it. It was our 12th developer summit. So we have been f we're really focused on this because I think there's an opportunity where you have a synchronous and an asynchronous. And there are times where they both can be used and, and even more importantly, complement each other, which is where the deep integration with edX we're looking for. So if, so let me go back. How would the integration work? Yep, so if you, if you noticed, when I did it on the X blocks, um, I have already logged into the course. So I was able, sorry, it wasn't Xbox. This was an LTI integration. We'll talk about Xbox in a moment. But by uh, having logged into the course, so if I, doing compiler construction. Compiler construction, it was a course I always wanted to take, my fourth year computer science, but I was always away on work terms. Last two winters I was there, I was always away on work terms. I never got to take it. So it's always my example that I use. So here I'm logged into an edX course. Again, this is hosted by AppSembler. And I just went to group collaboration. And uh, this was there, uh, enabled for me to join. So by, by having logged in, and in terms of I told you earlier that the, the recordings would be available. So here, if I look at a recording, now this is me doing it last night. Good thing I didn't wear the same shirt. Um, and here I am just, yeah. So this was Jesus and I at the office just doing a test before we got. So I could take that URL and I could share with anybody. Um, what we've done and elsewhere is we've actually turned those into single video files so they could be uploaded to a video content management system should edX get to the point where they have one. And um, the key thing here is I'm capturing it and I've got all the data as well. So that's the state. Like we've come pretty far for real-time collaboration. Um, I did a screenshot of it. There's one I did. So there's a bunch of things that we can do. And this is where Ed, uh, Nate and I were hoping to get some feedback as well. We know there's some use cases where we could complement edX through the tutoring, maybe video assignment submission. Maybe the most interesting one is the student-to-student -student collaboration, where as part of your online course, edX is going to match you up with three random people. And if you've ever done team projects before, you know it's one of the hardest sometimes things to do, but it's also the thing that you'll learn the most. All those bad experiences you had in team projects. I shouldn't say they're all bad, maybe they're good. Uh, it's, it's the real life workforce. So if someone's looking to gain experiences about how to collaborate with each other, uh, we could give that collaboration. So some of the thoughts we had on deepening integration was definitely doing X blocks. So uh, we did LTI because it was the shortest path, but all the other integrations we've done with learning management systems, with Canvas, with Schoology, with Genzibar, uh, with Sakai, and with Moodle, uh, they're all native integrations. So I have developers who are very good at writing integrations of their systems. Um, if we do an integration with Xbox, a couple of things fall out. One of them is we can get data back into the system. So we could take the data that was captured in a recording in terms of like how long users were there, did they participate, put that back into edX. We could do something with the recordings. Um, if there's parts of it where it's sort of like completion activities that you must do this before you can get the credit. We could get the data back into edX to say, yes, the students did do at least two hours of collaboration. So at this point, I'd be very interested in your guys' feedback. If you could wave a magic wand, if there was a way that you could take some capabilities of real-time collaboration and put them into edX for specific use cases, what would those use cases be? We haven't covered them here. And what would you like to be able to do with that collaboration? And Yes. Yes. We can share screens too. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think I'm still there. So if I share my screen, oh, I got to do this. Do I have the Chrome extension? I will 
hang on one second. If I go to take this link, okay, I'm just going to sign in. And oh yeah, hang on. Too many years in front of the computer. We um, Chrome requires an extension to share the screen, but Firefox will do it. Uh, okay. And let's just go into it. Okay. And if I join it. So we're going to come up. I won't share the audio. You should see my webcam. And if I make myself presenter, and if I share my screen, do I want to share the entire screen? Yes. And then it should come up. Um, and now anybody in that session would see my screen. So, and now we see the cool more effect. So yeah, sharing the screen is there. Um, It's the reality of it. It's actually a very tough problem to solve, like real-time collaboration. It must work for 20 people for two hours with zero glitches. And that's what we've been working on for years. Um, we've had some very big deployments. There's technically nothing that the commercial apps can do that we can't do. And I think you'd probably say the same thing with edX there's, or open edX. There's nothing technically the other LMS vendors can do that you can't do. It's just a matter of where you put your priorities in that. Our bet is that the the stack that we build on in the open source community is becoming or has powerful enough that with the integration and the building on top of it, you can get real time sharing of audio, video, slides, chat, desktop, and it can be solid. And that's, that's what we've been doing for over eight years. So I don't know, did I answer your question? So um, the answer is yes. Uh, we actually do it as pure HTML5. So if you run this on your Android or your iOS device, you don't have to download an app. Now we could wrap it in a very simple app that just has a web view in it, and you could call it an app and put it on the App Store. But our bet is that the HTML5 technologies for real-time collaboration are going to get and have gotten as good as commercial apps. And so we're pushing hard on just the pure HTML5 but if someone wanted to embed us into their system, they could run it in a div tag or they could embed it inside. If they already have an app that is basically a progressive web client, you could embed BigBlueButton inside of it. So our bet is on not writing native apps, but on going hard down the road of HTML5. And every time I look at the release notes for Chrome, for example, and the stuff they're doing on WebRTC, it's like, wow, we don't have to build any of that. We build on top of it. Yes? Yes, so it is both. So if I play this recording, so I did this last night. So this is an uh, image with scalable vector graphics being drawn on a canvas. Uh, we didn't chat, the chat would come up here, but the video will play here, and that's a video stream. That's a VP9 uh, video stream. So we took all of this, actually that was. I mean, if I have three cameras in my recording screen, and while we're watching a recording, switch between cameras like in a real uh, big button. So no. So we were, so let me back up. When we create a recording, we basically bundle all the raw data, the audio stream and the individual webcams, plus the desktop sharing stream, plus the slides, plus all the events. We create, we created a number of uh, recording processing scripts that will turn that into various formats. One was a podcast format. People like podcasts. Another one was just the video of the screen sharing with the webcam. 
we don't do what you have suggested where instead of creating a single video file, we just basically have the individual video files that are streaming, but it could be done because all the raw content is there. So this is one of the things like when the US Department of Defense integrated, they basically wrote their own playback format because we gave them all the raw data. They just didn't want to do it in the way we did it. They just did their own way. Yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. As I said earlier, we use Big Blue Button to collaborate on Big Blue Button. Um, every Tuesday we do developer calls. For whatever reason, there's like two companies in Brazil that have been working on Big Blue Button for years. I don't know what it was about Brazil, but they went all in. Um, they, they love the open source side. So uh, we collaborate with Big Blue Button. We collaborate on Big Blue Button using Big Blue Button. And uh, what's that? We do, right? And I mean, it's, it's fun. As a product manager, manager, you're like, you're seeing your product evolve week after week. It just gets better and better. And that's been the progression for years. Question? Uh, we, oh, yes. So the, sorry, say it again. Ah, OK. So yeah, the question was, what are we using for the protocol? So right now, when we generate a recording, we actually generate like a data.json file, which has data like this. We could, in our processing scripts, send that back through XAPI, through Caliper, make a REST call, whatever. So again, the, the pieces are all there. Um, and this is where, you know, if we can get this into edX, if there was an endpoint, whatever format it was, we just write the caller for it. And then when the recording processes, send the data back. One thing we can do as well is when a session is created, the, the, the component that creates the session, the front end, can pass name value pairs along. So it could be there's a bunch of name value pairs that get passed into the recording, and later on in the recording scripts, it uses those name value pairs to figure out where to call back to. A very common example we've done for other learning management systems is notify the people who are in the session that the recording is available. They just get an email and they don't have to, they don't have to worry about it. Sure. Um, are you live processing the data as it comes in to detect events and update numbers, or do you post do you post processing? That's a very good question. So today we do the post processing, but the data is all flowing through the server live. So with looking at hooking into the Redis bus, you could have an app that potentially just gathers this data and then creates a dashboard. So the, the thinking there was the instructor presenting to like 20 students, if there was some telemetry that they got back, like how active were those students are, um, that may help them engage which students were not being like reached or not being at the keyboard or, you know, or just haven't done anything in the last half hour. Maybe that's a student I want to just call out. But today we do it after the fact, but all the data is flowing through and it could be done live as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so that is all React. It uses uh, MongoDB on the back end, and there's mini Mongo in the server. We have a node application to handle all the messaging. It goes through Redis, which is doing the, um, the message bus. And then there's a Scala-based application that's handling all the events. And uh, Red, um, Corento is writing the media streams to a server. Uh, FreeSwitch is writing the audio streams to the server. Once the session closes, uh, some scripts bundle all that up, send it to a bunch of other scripts that handle the workflow for archiving the recording, processing it, and publishing it. And then there's API calls that you can use to come in through Tomcat. Uh, so we have an application there that handles the um, starting the meetings, stopping the meetings, getting information on the meetings. Do you use Docker? Uh, it runs under Docker. So the last uh, while, uh, I've worked on getting the whole system running inside of Docker. So if you go to the Big Blue Button repository in GitHub, uh, you'll see the Docker image for it. You can pull it off of Docker Hub, and you can run this in a single Docker container. This may not be the way you would run it in scalable in production. Like, so one of our goals is to take this and bring it under a Kubernetes environment so it can do auto-scaling. Our longer-term goal is the way we differentiate. So who, someone mentioned Zoom and others. Okay. So, you're an open source project. How do you differentiate yourself from commercial entities? 
There's four things we can do. One is we're open source, so anybody can build on top of it. Two, if we get under Kubernetes, we're scalable. Three, we give you all the raw data for the recording format, so you can do with them what you want. And fourth, we have data and analytics that we can bring back to the system. So it's not this opaque box that I send people off to and sometime they came back. And as an open source project, you can build on top of those four pillars. Yes. I think you may be the last question. Yes. Sure. Okay. And we permit them to have collaborative engagement with each other. Now, currently, we are using a, another open source tool called AV, which is essentially a, a virtual classroom kind of environment. But we need to run, let's say, something like 150 different sessions, each session with one teacher somewhere and about 50 participants. Right. So, I have two questions. One is, what is the bandwidth requirement at the end user fee? Many times it is not a single user, but a group of participants who sit together, which is okay. Right. But what is the bandwidth they require for seamless learning? The second is, if I have to run multiple sessions, I presume that I will require an aggregate bandwidth at my place, which is okay. But individuals should not require more bandwidth. Is it possible to run these multiple sessions from my own cloud in IIT Bombay? So the first question, uh, bandwidth. So uh, every web conference system you see, what do you see in the marketing literature? You see this. Big, fat webcams. This is what you want to do. This is where your, your real learning is going to occur. No. Your real learning does not occur watching somebody for three hours. It occurs when you start figuring the, uh, problems together. So the bandwidth to do that, because we can do screen sharing, but those are all events. So when I was drawing on the whiteboard earlier on, just events. The audio stream, uh, WebRTC audio is about 50 kilobits. So we really try to keep the audio low, but you can do the streaming, the webcams if you want. So um, the answer is hopefully if the way we approach it may give you a bit more headroom in terms of the bandwidth requirements. They don't have to be as stringent. Um, and the second is if you want to run it at scale, so uh, you would probably run multiple big blue button servers and you could be, they could be in different places. So there's a bit more logic there that with my other hat on, I'm the CEO of Lineside Networks. We've helped companies scale. We run it at scale for many customers. We're kind of the edX to open edX as well, but we develop in the open source first. So we pull in the open source. We have built some load balancing and scaling technologies around it. Our goal is to open source those as well, like the Kubernetes side. So I want to get to where you can do kube control up, whatever, and up comes a fully scalable system that you can start building on top of. And then at that point, things start to cook. It all comes back to how many webcams you're streaming. The webcams will Google up most of, uh, gobble up most of it. Um, the answer would be yes if the, web, if the instructor is going to share his or her uh, bandwidth. Usually you have asymmetrical bandwidth, so you need good upstream if you're going to share your webcam. But I mean, in, if you look at our docs, we recommend like one, uh, one megabits down, 0.5 megabits up. And there's lots of room in there for sharing some webcams in that. My answer to that is always just try it out. Um, the last bit is I do have some big blue button stickers just so you know that you come here and you get goodies in that. But I just want to thank everybody for showing up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Come on. Oh, that was all you should have done? Do you have a flash on? Further along. Um, Good to see you again. Yeah, you too.
wonderful talk. Oh, thank you very much. And you were part of my, I'm short of my cars. You are FF fix in that uh, big I'm going to give you my card now. Yes, so I'll send you an email and uh, yes. wonderful work. Thank you. I have. I think I took your. We looked at big blue button several years ago when we were looking for a sort of uh, multi point uh, virtual classroom with 100 centers and so on. Yeah. We have ended up using AU, which is built by a university. But for collaboration, this is amazing work that you're doing. I guess we should. And, and we love open source. I'm going to take one of your take stickers. Take one of those. Thank you I so have much. To, oh, means you are. Thank you so much. Visiting card? No. <laughs> no. What is this? Oh, this is, oh, this is the big blue button. Yes, Can I take two of them? <laughs> okay. Thank That's you. my card and information. Yes. Thank you so much. Actually, may I have yeah. a card as well? I'm Olga. Olga, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Oh, sure. you're in Ottawa, Ontario. Yeah, I came here on the bus this morning. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, we had had a developer oh, you call it? Yeah, yeah. If you go to the store, you should be able to use the screen reader. I created the video. We have a student who's blind in this house yeah. and working with us just to make sure that he can go to the store. Cool. That's great. Um, one other question is what ports do you use? Because I, I know people who would like to use this in highly secure corporate environments. <laughs> 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 we have like a long laundry system. Uh, Or you can crunch it down to a small range, but you've got to have some ports for that uh, of RTC over here. Or you can put it in the You know, the difference from India has a different. It's no different. We know that. Every video stream would be a uh, connection. Um, so if you want to have like just 100 people, one to one, you could probably get by with like, give yourself room, like 25 ports or something. I'll send an email about this. Wonderful work, Fred. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Have you tried this before? Huh? You've seen me talk before, have you? Or you uh, yeah. You're talking with your big blue button, <laughs> actually, a year ago. Uh, we were, actually, we run this blue button server for uh, international, ser um, international Center for Nonviolent Communication. And they use it. Uh, the only problem with this is that from Saudi Arabia, it gets transferred. Yeah. I get emails from people who are in Saudi Arabia, and I'm like, okay, can we just talk? Because there's some.